Jesse and I don't represent Alcoholics Anonymous, Cocaine Anonymous, no fellowship. What we represent is our experience based on this material. What we represent is sponsoring hundreds of men and women each. Jesse sponsored only men. I've sponsored many women. And we're well over 300 people each. We do this work altruistically. And we take the lives of the people that we work with very fucking serious. Because we see people die. A lot. And if you know of us in the rooms, you know that we don't fuck around. And when we put on these big book studies in person, we get a lot of people showing up and we do no advertising. And it's for one reason, because they want to hear what the fuck is in this book. So that's what we're here to do. That's exactly what the fuck we are here to do, to show you based on our experience, what works, and what doesn't fucking work, what the rooms are going to tell you and what we're going to fucking tell you. And there's going to be some big fucking differences of what the rooms are going to tell you and what we're going to tell you. And you do whatever the fuck you want with it. But we're going to tell you what works. So, Jesse, I'm ready to go. Okay, so we're going to start off in the forwards to the first edition. X-I-I-I. Okay, I'm going to take this. Okay. I'm only going to read one paragraph. This is what we do. This is what I do when I take someone through the book. We have Alcoholics Anonymous, more than 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. To show other alcoholics precisely how we have recovered is the main purpose of this book. For them, we hope these pages prove so convincing that no further authentication will be necessary. We think this account of our experience will help everyone to better understand the alcoholic. And that's where I stop. I go back to the top. We have Alcoholics Anonymous, more than 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. Recovered. The word recovery, when you look up the word recovery, it actually is the process of becoming well after an illness or an injury. The process of becoming well. Just to highlight right off the bat, the illness that we have is we have a spiritual fucking malady. Unless, if this malady goes untreated, it creates an obsession of the mind, which allows us to have no fucking power and choice to pick up a drink, and we drink. And we set, we're different because we set off this allergy. But we need to medicate the fucking spiritual malady, because when the malady is overcome, we straighten out mentally and physically. So we will constantly be recovering from the illness of a spiritual malady. It never ends. And when we focus on the recovery from the malady, there's no fucking issue. You don't want to drink. You won't drink. You won't want to drink. That's a fucking guarantee. To show other alcoholics precisely, and look at the word precisely, it's in italics. To show other alcoholics precisely how we have recovered is the main purpose of this book. My purpose is to show you precisely clear-cut directions that are contained in this book so you don't want to drink, so you don't have to drink. Because if you don't focus on the malady and the clear-cut directions in this book, you will fucking drink. You will fucking pick up a drink. Why? Because it tells us in the doctor's opinion. We will succumb to the desire again, which means fail to fucking resist. We do not have the power of choice. You cannot play the tape forward. At a certain point, it will give way. So it's very important as we discuss and we go through this material precisely. Precisely means follow these directions precisely and get the results. And the results are laid out all through as the promises of this book. And they're much deeper than alcohol. When you look at the step 10 promises in this book, you only think about alcohol. We're here to fucking show you what the truth of those promises are. And it has fuck all to do with alcohol. Because the solution of this program has fuck all to do with alcohol. 
the problem of this fucking di- disease has fuck all to do with alcohol. It's about a spiritual malady that can be medicated with a way of life when you follow these clear cut directions precisely. For them, we hope these pages will prove so convincing that no further authentication will be necessary. So into the substance. We hope these pages right here will prove so convincing to anybody on here who struggles with the substance abuse problem of this illness. I hope these pages prove so convincing. Step one, we're talking about step one. That no further authentication is necessary. You don't need to go authenticize your fucking step one out there anymore. You go through the material that's right in front of you with somebody who knows the material and you will never have to authenticate your fucking illness out those doors ever again because this book is written for you and about you because it's written for me and about me. Once I understood the true predicament of step one, then I could fucking move forward. And I'll tell you what, it took a fucking long time for me to understand the true predicament of step one. A long fucking time. And I see people bang their heads on the gates of death and insanity because they do not understand step one because the fucking rooms do not teach us properly because we're not here in the book. We're sitting in three topic discussion meetings talking about our fucking opinion and our ideals and what we think is best for you when this fucking book can show me what's best for me. That's it, Nat. Okay, XIX, bottom of the uh, bottom of the page. <clears throat> While the internal difficulties of adolescent period were being ironed out, public acceptance of AA grew by leaps and bounds. For this, there were two principal reasons: the large numbers of recoveries in reunited homes. These made their impressions everywhere of alcoholics who came to AA and really tried 50% got sober at once and remained that way. 25% sobered up after some relapses. And among the remainder, those who stayed on with AA showed improvement. Other thousands came to a few AA meetings and at first they decided they didn't want the program. But great numbers of these, about two out of three, began to return as time passed. You taking that, Jess? No, it's all you. Okay. So what I what I want to highlight here is on the second page of what he read, of Alcoholics Anonymous who came to A and really tried, 50% got sober at once. That's not that's not a fucking joke. 50% of the people that were shown the clear-cut directions of this book. And you got to remember, in 1939, they vetted you as an alcoholic or an addict. Most of the rooms that we go to, you're you're welcome there if you have a desire not to drink. And because the messages are so diluted with so much bullshit and opinion, for the real deal alcoholic, he's not fucking even, doesn't even have a chance to stay sober at once because he's, he's getting misinformation. And why I wanted to to highlight this piece here is because Jesse and I both sponsor based on the clear cut directions of this book. I am getting 50% of the people I sponsor are staying sober at fucking once. They never drink again to this point in my recovery. 50 fucking percent. One person. Jesse is another one person. He's getting the exact same fucking results. Now you go talk to your average person sponsoring or your mental health expert who's running these treatment centers and ask them what the fucking rate of recovery is that they're getting. It's fucking 1%. It's 2%. One or two out of 100 will make it a fucking year. Jesse and I are sponsoring guys that are making it years and years and years. And it's not by fucking mistake. It's because we're showing them the clear-cut directions that are in this book, the spiritual disciplines and the fucking step tens and what you need to do on a daily basis to fucking combat the spiritual malady. Because this is not about white-knuckling a substance abuse issue. 
Because if you white knuckle and you resist the substance abuse issue, you're fucking as good as drunk. It's not by mistake that about 5%, let's, let's give it 5% out of 100 stay sober for a year. Out of that year, two and a half of those people make it to five years. Two and a half people out of 100 make it sober f- to five years. Why? Because they're missing the fucking directions. They're getting a whole bunch of, oh, yes, you got a year, you got a year, let's pat you on the ass, and you're on your way. Because you got a year away from drugs and alcohol. You know where they're on their fucking way to? They're on their way to a fucking relapse. And then we also get the people coming in, and, and, uh, and then us as a group, as a collective in the rooms, it's like, oh, you know what? Just keep coming back. Just keep coming back. Share your tears. Share your, your pain. And you know what? And hope you go home and don't drink. We'll be here for you. You know what happens? They go home, and they hope they don't drink, and they fucking drink. <laughs> and then they come back going, what the fuck am I doing? And we as the people in the rooms are going, Just keep coming back. Just keep coming back. Let's keep talking about the fucking, the the three topics on the board. Let's not put a step on the board. Let's not talk about what's fucking contained in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, selfish self-centeredness at the root of our troubles. Let's not talk about that. Let's not fucking be hard on you. Let's not care more about your fucking life than your feelings. 50% 50% are staying sober at once with me and Jesse. And that's not to put us on a pedestal or fuck all. That's to show you what the fuck is going on in here. Jess? Yeah, I mean, kind of just going off of what Bill says, the tr- a number of things, one of which is what Bill's talking about is instincts on rampage, Bach, and investigation. So that is to say, when these individuals are running and they are dominated by their instincts, they're not really interested in the real solution found in Alcoholics Anonymous. As far once we get the substance out of the way, right, and we get down to the root causes and conditions, they're still fully active in the root causes and conditions and getting some sort of release. We're not talking full release as like God, higher power, or even full release as, you know, drugs, alcohol, whatever their situation may be. They're in this in between where they're still getting some sort of a solution. But, you know, as with most of these solutions found in the material, they will eventually turn in flight and cut this individual to ribbons. Um, One thing I do want to point out about this 50 and 25% Uh, You know, you got to remember back in the late 1930s, there was very little options for alcoholics. So by the time this option came around and it wasn't death and it wasn't an asylum and it wasn't a ice pick lobotomy, you know, it was actually a, a way to be sober and content, sober and happy, right? Those two words always eluded me until I actually found this program. Being dry, I understood what that was. I understood how painful that was. But I also understood what drinking was, right? And it, it is this crossroads of I am fucked if I do and I'm just as fucked if I don't, right? And then being able to find the solution here. It wasn't until the 1950s that... Uh, Recording no, this was, that this was class of disease and once it was classed a disease, you have the private sector getting involved in it and you have government funding getting involved in it. And so both those aspects since the, I'd probably say since the 60s, have been bleeding into the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and has watered down our message quite significantly. Okay, I'm going to bust into the doctor's opinion. This will be XXV. We of Alcoholics Anonymous believe that the reader will be interested in the medical estimate plan of recovery described in this book. Convincing testimony must surely come from medical men who have had experience of the suffering of our members and have witnessed our return to health. 
a well-known doctor, chief physician at a nationally prominent hospital specializing in alcoholic and drug addiction gave Alcoholics Anonymous this letter. To whom it may concern, I've specialized in the treatment of alcoholism for many years. In late 1934, I attended a patient who, though he had been a, a competent businessman, a good earning capacity, was an alcoholic of a type I've come to regard as hopeless. In the course of his third treatment, he acquired certain ideas concerning a possible means of recovery. As part of his rehabilitation, he commenced to present his conceptions to other alcoholics, impressing upon them that they must do likewise with still others. This has become the basis of a rapidly growing fellowship to these men and their families. This man and over 100 others have appeared to recover. I personally know scores of cases who were of the type with whom other methods had failed completely. These facts appear to be of extreme medical importance because of the extraordinary possibilities of rapid growth inherited in this group. They may mark a new epoch in the annals of alcoholism. These men may well have a remedy for thousands of such situations. You may rely absolutely on anything they say about themselves. Very truly yours, William D. Soakworth, MD. The physician who, at our request, gave us this letter has been kind enough to enlarge upon his views and other statements which follows. In this statement, he confirms what we who have suffered alcoholic torture must believe that the body of the alcoholic is quite as abnormal as his mind. It did not satisfy us to be told that we could not control our drinking just because we were maladjusted to life, that we're in full flight from reality or outright mental defectives. These things were true to some extent, in fact, to a considerable extent with some of us, but we are sure that our bodies were sickened as well. In our belief, any picture of the alcoholic which leaves out the physical factor is incomplete. The doctor's theory that we have an allergy to alcohol interests us as laymen, our opinion as to its soundness may of course mean little, but as ex-prom drinkers, we can say that his explanation makes good sense. It explains many things for which we cannot otherwise account. Though we work on our solution on the spiritual as well as altruistic plane, we favor hospitalization for the alcoholic who is very jittery or befogged. More often than not, it is imperative that a man's brain be cleared before he is approached as he then a better, chanting, a better chance of understanding and accepting what we have to offer. The doctor writes. So does anybody know what this chapter is about? The doctor's opinion, this chapter. What is this chapter about? What's the main premise? What is the doctor's opinion? doctor's opinion is that we are fucked yeah that's what i was gonna say not really that not we have a, we have a disease mind and body yeah and that and that our alcoholism is um it's a disease okay so a lot of people are under the impression that this chapter tells you absolutely everything you know about the alcoholic problem and that's not true the only thing this talks about, the doctor's opinion, is the allergy of the body. Does anybody know why Dr. Silkworth can't talk about the mental obsession? He's a medical doctor, not a psych doctor. No, He's not an alcoholic. Does that make sense? So if he's not an alcoholic, then he doesn't know the strange mental blank spot. He doesn't know the insane trivial excuse or the plausible excuse, right? But really all he's done here is he's been put in a very unique situation where he's able to see alcoholics and heavy drinkers, probably not modern drinkers, but he's able to see these two types of drinkers. And over time, he's able to see, okay, this heavy drinker comes to me you know, he says he's going to do some stuff. You know, he's hit some hard life situations and I don't fucking see him again. But then there's this certain type of drinker, almost like a, a hopeless variety where I will see him and I will see him again and I will see him again. And every time I see him, he's just as baffled as the last time I see him. And then all of a sudden he dies or, or goes insane. When it comes to... Dr. Silkworth, in this chapter, there's three things 
that is, is very important to note. Like in the original manuscript and the first print, he didn't sign his name to it. It was XXXMD. And why that was, was three main things. One of which this is a medical doctor talking about God or talking about some sort of higher power, right? And so like the equivalent of that would be like, you know, going to see maybe a holistic doctor, right? In today's era who, you know, you would see this doctor with a sprained wrist and instead of giving you, you know, Western medicine, they, they give you some sage and, and, you know, tell you to burn it and, and maybe take, uh, you know, Epsom salt bath, something like that. That would kind of be the equivalent um, 1939 to today of what that would look like. And if it went south, he would be considered an absolute quack, right? He would ruin his career. Another thing is, is that Dr. Silkworth believed that the alcoholic didn't have mental control against the first drink, where the medical fraternity at that time, and still fairly prevalent today, uh, believe that the alcoholic does have mental control. That when you see an alcoholic on the streets, he's on the streets because he chooses to be there. It's his choice to drink the way that he's drinking, right? Dr. Silkworth said, no, I don't believe that that's true, right? Um, and another one is the doctor's opinion, the allergy of the body, which is to say that alcoholism has two components, one mental and one physical of the body. And these, I mean, if it was one of these things, and it got out, could potentially ruin his career, but it was all three. And this is why he didn't sign this. XXVI, it says the doctor's theory, this is three paragraphs down. The doctor's theory that we have an allergy to alcohol interests is lame in our opinion as to its soundness may of course mean little, but as x prom drinkers, we could say that his explanation makes good sense. It explains many things for which we cannot otherwise account. I'd like you to underline that. It explains many things for which we cannot otherwise account. And that piece, that piece right there explains what we're trying to do here, especially with the allergy of the body. The allergy of the body is the second nail of the coffin of the alcoholic. It's definitely not the first, but once the allergy of the body kicks off, it is his only fucking problem until the body's done with alcohol. He has a mind that gets him drunk and he has a body that keeps him that way, right? So when it comes to the doctor's opinion, this chapter of the allergy of the body can explain away a man's life 20, 30 years. He's been in a spree many times. And he can't really account that himself. So when you read the information, you present it, you go through your own experience. This could, this could be a missing piece of this guy's life for years and years. And same with the other chapters, you have the doctor's opinion, you have the latter half of there's a solution, which is the mental obsession. And then you have a whole chapter more about alcoholism dedicated to the mental obsession. And that's the purpose of these chapters is to explain many things to this individual that they couldn't otherwise account. Bill. Okay. I'm going back to the first page of the doctor's opinion. As we go through step one of this material, we're going to talk heavily about the substance like Jesse just did. And I'm going to pull some other pieces out. We're going to talk about, solution to the spiritual malady that's also contained and hidden itself within the literature that we look at that is dominated by the allergy and or obsession. Okay. Second last paragraph on the first page of the doctor's opinion. In the course of his third treatment, he acquired some ideas concerning a possible means of recovery. We're talking about Bill W. Bill W. was a patient at the town's hospital over and over and over and over. And he comes and returns to the fucking hospital. And he asked Dr. Silkworth. He acquired these certain ideas concerning a possible means of recovery. So Bill W. is out there collecting some data on what he th thinks might work here. 
As part of Bill's rehabilitation, he commenced to present his conceptions to other alcoholics, impressing upon them that they must do likewise with still others. This has been the basis of a rapidly growing fellowship of these men and their families. This man and over 100 others appear to have recovered. So what I want to highlight and what I talk about when I take the people I take through this material is on the very first page of the doctor's opinion. It gives me part of the solution to my fucking life. To my, to my, to my substance abuse issue, number one, and to the design for living, number two, which is actually number fucking one. Because when the spiritual malady is overcome, we straighten out mentally and fucking physically. So as I say, the main problem may be substance abuse. And, I, and we got part of the solution right here on this first page. But the real problem isn't the substance abuse. It's the fucking, it's medicating the spiritual malady. Now going back to the top of the page of the doctor's opinion where it says, we alcoholics and honest believe that the reader will be interested in a medical estimate of the plan of recovery detailed described in this book. Again, plan of recovery, not from the fucking mental obsession and not from the fucking allergy from the spiritual malady that kicks in the obsession and the obsession always kicks in the allergy. That's the, this is also the plan of recovery to all of that. The word plan. Anyone know what the word plan means? Anyone? I'll tell you what it means. It means a detailed proposal to achieve a fucking goal. A plan is like a blueprint. You want to build this building that I live in? You need a blueprint and you got to follow the blueprint from the foundation all the way up. Because if you're off one little degree or your, your building's leaning as you build it up, it's going to fucking fall down. We have a plan of recovery right here in this book. And then we go back down as part of his rehabilitation. Part of my rehabilitation, it tells me right here, is that I commence to present my conceptions to others, which is you guys tonight, impressing upon you, you must still do likewise with others. And when I work with another alcoholic addict, this is not optional. You come and you ask me for help as an alcoholic addict because you want to get well, Part of your fucking deal is you will fucking help another alcoholic addict through this material right here. That's part of the deal. Why? Because as part of my rehabilitation, I must concept to do this with others, impressing upon them that they must do still likewise with others. The word must is very important here. It means requirement. And I'll tell you, anybody here who does the 12 steps, the 12 steps will give you a lot. Let's say you get your ass through the 12 steps and you're actually only through step 11 and a half. You get through the 12 steps or 11 and a half, you're going to get a lot. You're selfishly going to get a lot. But the 12th step, there's one aspect, working with others, that will give you fucking everything. Everything in your life will come from the 12th step. But most people are so selfish and self-centered, they will never fucking see what I'm talking about. This has been the basis of a rapidly growing fellowship. The basis, the foundation. Never avoid these responsibilities if you assume them. Helping others is the foundation stone of your recovery. Right out of working with others. Never avoid these responsibilities, it says right in our literature. Helping others is the foundation stone of your recovery. This doesn't mean we, we just do acts of altruism. We get to the point where we actually work in altruism. In altruism. <laughs> I'm going to flip the page. I'm going to go down to what something Jesse had already read. And I'm going to re-highlight something else. The last page or last paragraph on XXVI. So on the second page of the doctor's opinion, 
It gives me the rest of the solution to my life and the rest of the solution to my substance abuse, spiritual malady problem. First page, it told me I work with others. Now, what does it say? It says, though we work out our solution. Boom, solution on the spiritual as well as the altruistic plane. There it is, boys and girls. Right there. We work out our solution to life on the spiritual and altruistic plane. And both of those are very important because the, the directions of altruism are contained within this big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. The spiritual disciplines are contained within the directions of this big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. But I'm going to say for the purposes of what I'm talking about right now, the altruistic plane is more important. Because through the altruistic action and the altruistic plane, you actually will work the spiritual disciplines inherently, period. What is altruism? Does anyone have a definition of altruism for me? Unmute and tell me what it is. Without profit motive. Okay. It's for the greater good. Giving without okay. getting. Okay, we're on the right track. Unselfish Basic. giving of oneself for the well-being of another. Perfect. Unselfishly devoting oneself to the welfare, happiness, and well-being of other people. Write that definition down because this is the definition of working altruistic plane as the solution in my life. Unselfishly devoting oneself to the welfare, happiness, and well-being of other people. And when I first started doing the work that was contained in this book, when I had six months sober and my sponsor said, you're now going to sponsor some guys, you're going to do some service and you're going to do this other shit. I was like, what the fuck? Like, who really wants to do that? Don't you know I got a fucking life and I need to get on with the business of being self-satisfied? I just lost my fucking million dollar company and all the shit that I had. And I got to fucking get on with the business of fucking getting the shit back, bro. That's what I, that's my fucking goal. But the thing about me is I got beaten up so bad. I listened to what my fucking sponsor told me. And I also had come so far within the literature and not understanding any of it at this point that I was like, holy fuck. Okay. I'm going to, some of this stuff is actually coming true, whatever, to whatever degree. So I said, okay, to my sponsor and I started sponsoring and I started answering my phone and specifically chairing meetings and I didn't want to do any of this shit so what was I doing I was doing acts of altruism I was doing an act of altruism that my little fucking pre-brain would tell me I'm doing altruism I wasn't doing altruism I was doing an act of altruism that my fucking pea brain that will rationalize and justify the most errant nonsense to tell myself I am fucking being altruistic. By definition, I was not being altruistic. I was not unselfishly devoting myself, my health, my welfare to your welfare, health and well-being. I was fucking helping you because I wanted to stay the fuck alive. The motive was so fucking selfish that it made my own head spin when I realized it years later. But it didn't matter. The only thing that mattered was I was doing something that pro pro progressed me into the next phase of altruism. The next phase of altruism took me about a year to two years to get to where I started going, holy fuck, helping people and doing some of the stuff makes me feel good. And I started realizing every time I would feel like shit and I would go help somebody, I would feel better. So I started connecting the dots. One plus one equals two. I feel like shit. Call somebody, go help them. I feel better. And then I still think I'm working all altruistically. But I am moving in the right direction. But the motive was still selfish and self-centered because I wanted what I fucking wanted. I wanted to feel good. And then what happened? I keep working with others. I keep chairing the meetings. I keep doing this stuff. And then we get about three years in 
and I, my phone rings and it's any time in the middle of the night and it's somebody that needs help and I don't even fucking think twice. I'm, at, I'm going into a fucking flames game. The flames game is not an option because now this guy needs help. My whole perception of fucking helping somebody changed. I had no fucking desire for profit, for motive, for validation, for nothing. I started doing this work on selfishly devoting oneself to the welfare, happiness, and well-being of other people. And everything started fucking changing. And very, very few people ever get to that stage. But the fucking promises of this big book are riddled with that in mind. And if you want a good life, if you want a fulfilled life, what I'm telling you is the goal is just to try to work in the altruistic plane. Through the altruistic plane, you become spiritual, period. That's why it's almost more important. But it really is no more important. It's equally as important as the spiritual plane. Our thought life will be placed on a much higher plane when our thinking is cleared of wrong motives. Through the directions of this program, through what we do, that's what fucking happens. Jesse, do you want to take anything from that? The subject presented in this book seems to me to be a paramount importance to those afflicted with alcoholic addiction. I say this after many years experience as medical director, one of the oldest hospitals in the country treating alcoholic and drug addiction. <clears throat> there was therefore a sense of real satisfaction when I was asked to contribute a few words on a subject which is covered in such masterly detail in these pages. We doctors have realized for a long time that some form of moral psychology was of urgent importance to alcoholics, but its application presented difficulties beyond our conception. Well, with our ultra-modern standards, our sci scientific approach to everything, we're we are perhaps not well equipped to apply the powers of good that lie outside our synthetic knowledge. Many years ago, one of the leading contributors to this book came under our care in this hospital, and while here, he acquired certain ideas, which he put into practical application at once. Later, he requested the privilege of being allowed to tell his story to other patients here, and with some misgiving, we consented. The cases we had followed through have been most interesting. In fact, many of them are amazing. The unselfishness of these men as we have come to know them, the entire abstinent, a profit motive, and their community spirit is indeed inspiring to one who's labored long and weary in this alcoholic field. They believe in themselves and still more in the power which pulls chronic alcoholics back from the gates of death. Of course, an alcoholic ought to be freed from his physical craving for liquor, and this often requires a definite hospital procedure before psychological measures can be a maximum benefit. We believe and so suggested a few years ago that the action of alcohol on these chronic alcoholics is a manifestation of an allergy, that the phenomenon of the craving is limited to this class never occurs in the average temperate drinker. These allergenic types can never safely use alcohol in any form at all. And once having formed the habit, found they cannot break it. Once having lost their self-confidence, their reliance upon things human, their problems pile up in them and become, become astonishingly difficult to solve. For out the emotional appeal seldom suffices, the message which can interest and hold these alcoholic people must have depth and weight. In nearly all cases, their ideals must be grounded in a power greater than themselves if they are to recreate their lives. If any feel that as psychiatrists directing a hospital for alcoholics we appear somewhat sentimental, let them stand with us a while on the firing lines. See the tragedies, despairing wives, little children. Let the solving of these problems become a part of their daily work and even of their sleeping moments. And the most cynical will not wonder that we have accepted and encouraged this movement. We feel after many years of experience that we have found nothing which has contributed more to the rehabilitation of these men than the altruistic movement now growing up among them. Okay, so XXVIII. So we, we doctors have realized for a long time, that piece, Dr. Silker says that he understands the solution to the problem. The solution to the problem as he sees it is some sort of moral psychology. But the moral psychology presented difficulties, the application of that presented difficulties beyond his conception. It's 1939 he sang this. Fast forward all the way up to 2021. I don't believe that's changed. At least that's my experience is that the confusion of the medical fraternity back then 
82 years later is just as confused. The problem is though, is that it's confused with a little bit of, it's confused with like the, with, with the idea that they know they're still fucking confused, but they have some sort of pride. They have some sort of, uh, almost like elitism that they know the fucking chips that they have the, all the chips. Um, and they're just really not willing to give the chips to anybody. The pure difference between Alcoholics Anonymous and the medical fucking fraternity is the medical fraternity will diagnose full blown, full blown symptoms of alcoholism. So alcoholism manifested the appearance of it could look like a fucking hundred things. It could look like PTSD. It could look like ADD, ADHD, bipolarism, anxiety, uh, chronic depression. It's not to say that an alcoholic can't have those things and those things be real. It is to say when you're working with a new alcoholic, it would be best to get this individual 12 stepped and then see what we're dealing with. Most men that I've worked with have been diagnosed with one or many of these things. We go through the 12 steps. He's a 12 step member doing the deal. And these things seem to rectify themselves. The difference between the two Alcoholics Anonymous does not pay attention to the far reaching symptoms of alcoholism. We go right down to the root causes and conditions. And then we see what is and what isn't. Many years ago, that piece they go on to say practical application at once, which is to say that when an individual gets this solution, first, when the individual gets this problem, understands what we're actually dealing with. If we catch him at the right time, this moment of opportunity where he's laid out, laid out for a conversion experience, and this individual is actually able to hear what we're saying to him, the chances are that he gets a gut level concession or a concession to the innermost self, which is a proper step one. And then from there, there's no him and Han. There's no questions. There's no him and Han on an inventory or a step five, a confession or doing the fucking amends or sponsoring people. He understands at a gut level, which doesn't shake away, that his ass is on the line. And this individual will do the work necessary in order to have a spiritual experience and beat out this problem. One thing I do like though, later he requested the privilege, that whole paragraph. The doctor writes the unselfishness of the unselfishness of these men as we have come to know them, the entire abstinent, a profit motive and their community spirit is indeed inspiring to one who has labored long and weary in this alcoholic field. This isn't, one alcoholic talking about another alcoholic. This is a third party talking about an alcoholic. And so why I find this so interesting is that if you are to talk to society as a whole, because of many, because of many misgivings of the program, people coming in, coming out, people getting sober for a couple of weeks, making amends, all these other things. My, at least my experience in talking to society about Alcoholics Anonymous is generally not always positive. Seems to be one or two people that I talk to, let's say maybe even four or five out of 10, definitely has a negative experience with Alcoholics Anonymous or an Alcoholics Anonymous member. And so I find it very interesting, so much so that I set this as a bar for myself when I react around society, right? I don't go into work and tell everybody that I'm an alcoholic. Few people know that I'm an alcoholic in all aspects of my life. And why that is, is I only make the admission when it would serve some good purpose. Because the simple fact is, is I'm not fucking perfect. Very few people are. I do strive for perfection, but at the end of the day, I will take the progress because I'm human. And if all these people know that I'm in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, there's a very good chance I could give the program of Alcoholics Anonymous a bad name and in turn, potentially turn somebody away from uh, going to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. 
XXV triple I next page. We believe and so suggested a few years ago that the action of alcohol on these chronic alcoholics is a manifestation of an allergy that the phenomenon of craving is limited to this class never occurred and never occurs in the average temperate drinker. I would have you underline, we believe to all the way to average temperate drinker. So arrived at this stage, this is where we chat about the, um, the allergy of the body. This is the first time that it's presented. I don't want to talk about, like in the book, there's many, there's many pieces that'll lead up. There are many opportunities to chat about it, but what would happen is, is that I would speak about it. I would give it all that I have on just some little frivolous piece. And then when it's actually presented in its fullest form, I would have no ammunition for it. That's why this is where I chat about it, is because this is a full out definition of what the allergy of the body is. What is the allergy of the body? So when you hear the allergy of the body defined, you will hear that once I pick up, I can't stop. And while that's true, it's so fucking surface. It's so surface that there's no way that it will move any fucking individual. And so when you chat about these mainstay pieces of what the fuck this chapter is about, you have to make sure that it's relatable. You have to make sure that it's fucking common sense. And you were looking to stir this individual. You were looking to, to talk about this in such a way that it's fucking tangible, that this individual understands at once what the fuck you're talking about? And there's absolutely no confusion. So how I do that is I will talk about kind of from like a medical stance, right? So allergy to alcohol. If I was allergic to, let's say, bee stings and I got a bee sting, that allergy will manifest itself and maybe sw uh, swelling of the bite, right? Maybe itchiness of the bite, uh, you know, a little bit of closing of the um, the throat here, some stuff like that. And all that is going to be a negative reaction. If I'm an alcoholic, real deal, and I have the allergy of the body, I'm allergic to alcohol, that allergy will manifest itself in a phenomenon of craving, which also to a lot of people seem to think that like, if I were to go to a bar tonight, I would go to the bar like a Dr. Jekyll, prim and proper, okay. And then when I put alcohol into my system, I'm a, I'm a madman. And my experience is the exact opposite. I go to the bar, a madman out of sorts, and I pick up alcohol and it straightens me out. I pick up alcohol and I feel like the doctor. I feel like fucking Sean Connery's James Bond. I feel like the man, one main thing that alcohol did for me, at least a couple of drinks to get to that sweet spot is I would be fully present in my life. If I went to a bar and I had a couple of drinks, I would be acutely zoned in to what is going on. When I'm sober or dry rather, don't fucking look at me. I'm so restless, irritable, discontented that until I have that drink, once I have that drink, I'm sorted out. I feel right. From one drink to the next, there's not much that really runs through my mind. Of really, all I'm thinking is this drink's good. The next one's going to be better. The main thing that's missed about the allergy of the body is that it is two separate components. A lot of people are under the impression that once they put alcohol into their system, they have the ability to shut it down through the mind, right? And in my experience is, is that once I pick up alcohol, everything looks like a conscious choice until it's not, until it's clearly not. So generally how this goes, is I'll pick up alcohol, I'll drink for maybe a week, maybe two, and all of it looks like a conscious choice. So I'll go to a bar, and uh, my idea was I'm going to shut it down at maybe 10 o'clock, but the atmosphere is getting good. Maybe the game's getting good, whatever. And it looks as if I had made the conscious choice to shut it down at three, right? And I'll do this for roughly about a week until I don't want to go to the bar in the first place. And then there I am at the bar again, 
shutting it down. And then my mind catches up with my body. Right now I understand what the fuck is going on here. I don't want to be at this bar yet. Here I am. This is the hellish torture where I understand that I should not drink, that I can't drink, that if I have another drink, it's all fucking over. But it doesn't matter. I mean, I come to that realization in the morning and I'm drunk by 10 or after work if I'm lucky enough to have a job. And that is the, the allergy of the body is once it kicks off, the mind is 100% inoperable for me to stop drinking. I am done with alcohol when the body's done with me. A couple of things I want to point out. Once having formed the habit, found they cannot break it. That's fair. Once having lost self-confidence, what are they talking about? Once having lost self-confidence, can anybody answer that? Self-confidence in what? In not picking up another drink. Yeah, 100%. Once, once having lost self-confidence in my own ability to stop myself, once having, so the reliance upon things human, what's that? Once having lost my self-confidence, once having lost uh, my, my reliance upon all things human, what are they talking about, all things human? Worldly material self-shit. Yeah, I mean like- I will. Yeah, yeah, like wife, uh, husband, kids, career, if we're lucky enough to have it, money in the bank. Those are the things that when it comes to the heavy drinker, the heavy drinker has the ability to stop and or moderate. And the alcoholic has been trying to live by that definition for a majority of their life. It's not, it's not when it's not when I was drinking in high school early 20s, any of that shit that this was apparent. This book only illuminated itself to me when I tried to stop. And I only understood that illumination um, when I was in a position to hear what the, this book was talk, talk, talking about. I'd been in rooms where people had alluded to some of these things, but I was not laid out in order to hear it. I was not humbled enough in order to hear what was being talked about. Lost, their problems pile up on them and become astonishingly difficult to solve. Frothy emotional appeal seldom suffices. So when I am in a spree, when I've kicked off the allergy of the body, the body's running the show. I almost exhibit behaviors as like a sociopath, psychopath, where I had been in many instances where had I been normal, I would have been able to stop seeing what I'm seeing. But the problem is like, well, one example that's always been burnt in, into my consciousness was uh, I was in my early 20s and I was engaged and there was this woman who, the, the woman I was engaged to, I specifically remember her telling me that if I went on this run, if I left the house with this rent money, we were going to be out on our ass. And it's not to say that I didn't care about her. It's not to say that I didn't understand what she was saying to me. It is to say that when she was saying this, it didn't have enough. It didn't have enough to, to, to smash through the allergy of the body and hit my mind. And then all of a sudden I could put that in my mind to shut it down. I understood what was happening, but it, it wasn't enough. You, I could go through a lot of intellectual things when the allergy of the body is kicked off. And I, I don't have the ability to use it because what's making me drink is no longer of the mind. It is of the body. Frothy emotional appeal seldom suffices when I'm kicked off. It's only when the body's done with me that I am done with alcohol, at least for that brief moment of time. And I think, okay, so depth and weight. So if I were, if like right now, we have the ability to chat about the disease as much as we want. We have the ability to talk about how painful it is what alcohol will do to you if you are to drink, what alcohol has done to you. And we could kick that conversation in the fourth gear because we have a solution here, right? If this book was only the three chapters, it would be no different than me going to the stage four cancer ward. 
telling everybody there on that ward what will happen to them, how it will happen to them. And then just walking off the ward saying, okay, Jim, okay, Jerry, good talking to you. That would be the equivalent here. It's not that. We have depth away because we have a solution. And that solution is found in Alcoholics Anonymous. Bill? Jess, can you elaborate on the stage four cancer ward and the inability for the patient who is in the fucking room of Alcoholics Anonymous to see the fucking truth of the fourth stage cancer ward that they sit in? And why do you think that it's so fucking difficult for them to see that? Yeah. Via the message, via the theories, via the opinion. Yeah. I mean, so the stage four cancer word, when I go to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, that's how I've treated it for many years of my recovery. Under, you understand this information. You understand that, you know, in, in working with others, it says, remember, they are very ill. In the original manuscript, it says, remember, they are fatally ill. Right. And these are the new the new individuals that are coming to our rooms and how that's get how that predominantly gets missed is because when these individuals come here, it's wrapped up in pride. Right. It's wrapped up in self. It's it's very easily masked when you have, you know, an individual comes, he's out like, I'll give you an example. I was flat broke, homeless. And I was coming to the program in a full out suit. When Bill met me, he thought I was some oil and gas executive. And in reality, I was just some homeless fucking bum, some drunkard. But that's what I, I'm dying of alcoholism. But it is very imperative for you to understand that I still have some things together. And so it's only when an individual comes to the program and they don't have an answer anymore. The book talks about the real deal alcoholic coming to our rooms baffled, right? And that's, that's the best formula is they, they come to the rooms under the lash of alcoholism. Alcohol is a great persuader specifically on the spiritual aspect of this program. That's why I believe it's missed. I think that people don't treat the rooms like that because they don't actually understand this information that we're talking about right now. And even if they do understand the information, in order to properly pre to present it to another alcoholic, they have to be talking to the alcoholic that's baffled, not to the alcoholic that has all the plans. You could beat your head against a wall talking to all the alcoholic who has all the alcoholics who have who have plans the odds are they will either die or they will come back to the program properly persuaded and if they are properly persuaded then then you you have a better chance at reaching them when they're laid out for for a conversion experience as opposed to having all the answered and and still wrapped up in self and pride does that answer your question yeah and i'm going to follow up on that in the chapter, Working With Others, it talks about uh, disturb your prospect on the question of alcoholism. He is, then has a better chance of accepting what we have to offer. So as we go into these rooms and you get a guy who's been crushed by his own self-imposed crisis, he could no longer postpone a vape. He's got no more family. He's got no more fucking job. Maybe he has a job. Maybe he has a family, but he knows he's fucked. He's been beaten. And he comes into the rooms. And he's really got nothing, but maybe he has a couple of things to hold on to. And then the people in the rooms give him the hope of hang on to that shit. You haven't lost it all, bro, and nor do you need to. And then we fucking pick him up. And we fucking soften his bottom for him. And we just tell him, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Keep coming here. You present me with that fucking individual in the room. 
I am going to fucking lash out the last bit of hope that fucker has. I'm going to disturb him on the question of alcoholism to a fucking degree. He's going to fucking never fucking forget who I fucking am. I'm going to fucking cut him with the words and what the fucking true predicament of what we're dealing with is. And I've heard Jesse share this before. You're not remembering the guy who fucking shines your shoes and fucking gives you a little pat on the head and a fucking kiss on the forehead and say you're on your fucking way. You're remembering the guy who fucking cut you. And what I've noticed about the program that that I attend is Jesse and I, we go and we fucking disturb the fucking cancer ward on the question of alcoholism. While everyone else is fucking there, fucking shining your shoes, we're fucking there to dirty your fucking shoes. <laughs> and the way this works is I predict your fucking future. I predict your future based on the fucking content produced in this book, basically in step one. You either accept the spiritual solution or you die an alcoholic death. And I'll tell you before you die an alcoholic death, I'm going to tell you how you're fucking getting there. You're going to get there by the real alcoholic cycle. You're going to go to fucking detox. You're going to come out of there with a fucking, a little bit of hope. You're going to fucking have your ego reassert itself. You're going to fucking get a fucking a, a job. You're going to get a fucking chick. You're going to get some fucking wheels. And then what happens? The fucking wheels fall off. And the wheels will continually fall off. And selfish self-centeredness, we must be rid of it or it fucking kills us and these people fucking die. And what happens over the years of and years of Jesse and I hammering the same shit, the guys who fucking leave the room and fucking call sh- talk shit about us and fucking want nothing to fucking do with us, guess who's fucking their sponsor a year or two or three years down the fucking road? <laughs> Isn't it fucking true, bro? It's fucking true. And then what happens? That's why I got the success rate of 50%. Because if you're coming to me or Jesse or anybody like us and you want our fucking help, you ain't here to fuck around. You're here to fucking listen and you're here to watch what we're doing here. And not only do we fucking speak what we speak, we walk this way of walk in our fucking lives which I think is the most important because any fucking knucklehead can spew out this material, but not any knucklehead can spew out this material with the passion and through the living experience of what we do. And then as you're sponsored by us, you get to see. And every individual who gets sponsored individually by us has a different experience because every individual has a different path through the 12 steps. The path through the 12 steps doesn't change. The individual experience through the steps changes. So when I hear everybody's journey is fucking different, everyone's experience and everyone's recovery is different. Yeah, your experience might be different, but your journey through the 12 steps is exactly the fucking same as it was the guy fucking before you. And if you think you're that fucking unique snowflake where it is fucking going to be different from you, then you better fucking hit the fucking road and find Jesse to fucking sponsor you. Because it sure the fuck ain't going to be me. Jess, anything before I move on? Uh, Yeah, definitely. Uh, Just to kind of reiterate a couple points, one of which is, and, and I love that. I hear that all the time. I hear that this is, you know, like uh, I work my own program. This is my program. You know, I do it this way. I do it this way. Um, you know, this is my own personal experience. And like the problem with that is that this program is is actually meant to be wholesale basis. This program, it's not uniqueness of me and Bill. I don't believe that one fucking bit. This is what I believe. As I believe that me and this gentleman were desperate enough, um, we were able to accept what was in this book and our lives had dramatically changed since then. What's unique about us is probably our sponsorship. You'll find that's a little bit unusual, how many guys we sponsor. 
but I do not believe that I that I have a special brand of this fucking book. And I, you know, drank from the cup of Bill Wilson, anything like that. And so now I'm empowered or, or anything like that. I just believe that I was desperate enough to get this fucking thing. And the process to get this thing that I've took, that Bill have taken, has taken, uh, the process that we give to our sponsees, right out of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, that doesn't fucking change. What I love about the big book is whatever's in black and white cannot be fucking combat. A lot of the times what you hear is not what's in the book. You'll hear opinions running to the extremes or theories. Somebody says to themselves, fuck, I bet you that'll sound good. So then they say it. It's not even fucking practical. They haven't even done it themselves. What is unique, though, is the spiritual experiences that an individual can get from the program for that can get to the process. A man that I work with might have a spiritual experience in one. Next man might not have a spiritual experience in one. Another man might have one and we agnostic. Generally, that's, that's the rule. One might have one on his knees. One might not have one. You have to have spiritual experiences in five. There's no doubt about that. Guy might have it in six. Guy might not have it in six. That's what's unique about the program is the individual experience going through the program out of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, which hasn't changed. 1939 to 2020 has not changed. Another thing I want to point out is that, you know, when Bill talks about disturbing guys, the question of alcoholism, you do that because this individual is going to be more likely to follow your suggestions. That doesn't mean I go to a room and I smack a guy around expecting he to, you know, tur then turn around and say, oh, Jess, do you want to sponsor me? That has never happened in my life. <laughs> what happens is, is that I will go to a meeting. I will intuitively through meditation throughout that meeting, be drawn to certain uh, individual men for reasons that I don't know. And I will go up to them and I will chat with them. Generally, I've spoken in that room, so I won't have to sell myself of being an alcoholic to that individual. And then from there, well, I'm going to take them through the questions. How long have you been sober? I've been sober a month. What step are you on? You're not on any steps and you don't have a sponsor. Well, that's pretty fucking brutal, dude. You know, and I'll go off something like that. I just had, it's funny what Bill's talking about. I just had a guy that I've known for probably four years. I've been disturbing this fucking guy for four years. He just called me about a week ago. And he says, Jess, you know, will you sponsor me? And I said, why? I said, why now? It's been four fucking years, right? You've known me for four years. I've done the same thing for four years. And he said, well, Jess, the, for four years that I've known you, you know, I've known the guys that you've sponsored. I know the program that you run, uh, yada, yada, this, yada, yada, that, right? I mean, what I used to do early recovery is I throw everybody in my car and I disturb the whole fucking car. I'd be talking to one guy, but I'd actually be talking to the whole room, the whole car, right? And then I'd say, all right, see you fuckers. I drop them off. All right, guys, good luck. Good luck with that. Then one or two will call me, hey, Jess, you know what you're speaking about in that meeting? Uh, all right, you know, yeah. you take me through the book, take me through the information. I don't think people understand the importance of William Silkworth, Dr. Silkworth, in the program of Alcoxon Anonymous. Without, without William Silkworth, who observed he was the one who figured out the fucking problem because without the problem figured out you know what they used to do to us they would fucking perform lobotomies they would put us in insane asylums they would kill us they would throw us onto the streets so dr silkworth is of utmost importance to the program step one especially understanding what we're fucking dealing with and I don't think Dr. Silkworth gets really enough accolades. And what he actually represents is he represents the whole of the medical fraternity in the fucking United States of America and as the world as a whole. So it's not just Dr. Silkworth. Dr. Silkworth is the spearhead of a whole bunch of fucking doctors and psychologists and psychiatrists trying to fucking deal with alcoholics and addicts and have no fucking idea what is wrong with us. So they would do all these other things to us. But the doctor, middle of the page on XXVII, 
we doctors have realized, we doctors as the fraternity have realized for a long time that some form of moral psychology was of urgent importance to alcoholics. So they realized for a long fucking time that some form of moral, moral rearrangement, psychology within the head was of urgent importance. But it says that presented difficulties, its application presented difficulties beyond our conception. They didn't know how to fucking do this moral rearrangement. It presented difficulties beyond their conceptions. With, with their ultra-modern standards and their scientific approach to everything, we are perhaps not well equipped to apply the powers of good that lie outside our synthetic knowledge. Does anybody know what he's saying at the end of that paragraph? That they're not well equipped to apply the powers of good that lie outside the, their synthetic knowledge. The powers of God. The powers of fucking God. As this doctor and his people are watching, they're seeing this guy putting into practical application at once a program of fucking spiritual and altruism. And he's watching this going, they're not well equipped. We're not well equipped to apply the powers of what is going on in front of us. The powers of good, the powers of God. And he's watching this going, holy fuck. And here we are scientists trying to figure this shit out. And then he goes on to write, many years ago, Bill W. again, this is the same story as previously in the doctor's opinion. Many years ago, one of the leading contributors to this book came under care in our hospital, Bill W. And while here, he acquired some ideas that he wanted to put into practical application at once. Very important. We talk about the precise clear-cut directions. Now, Bill W. is coming back, and he wants to put practical application at once of some ideas that he's fucking contained through his journey. Part of what he's contained through his journey is what he's learned from Dr. Silkworth. So the doctor, along with his colleagues, later he requested the privilege of being allowed to tell his story to other patients here. So Bill W. is saying, okay, doc, can I fucking show you guys something? Can I request this privilege of, of sharing my story with some of the patients here? And the doctors are like, I don't fucking know, dude. I don't really know what the fuck you're up to. But back in 1939, they said, okay. And it says, and with some misgiving. So with some like, okay, you fucking better not fuck us here. Because we're fucking, we're, we're laying this out for you. Don't fuck us. With some misgiving, they consented as the fucking hospital of a whole, as a whole. And you got to remember, this isn't just some fucking hospital. This is the town's fucking hospital. One of the most prominent hospital dealing with drug and alcohol addicts in fucking North America. This isn't just some fucking rundown hotel hospital. So they consented. And then the doctor goes on to write, the cases that we had followed through have been most interesting. So now they're following Bill W and watching the cases. And he's like, these are fucking interesting. And then he goes, in fact, many of them are fucking amazing. So this doctor who spent his whole life trying to help us watches this fucking drunk come in here, put into practical application some ideas at once and fucking says, this is interesting. Actually, it's fucking amazing. And this guy, this doctor Silkworth isn't 30 fucking years old. He's 60 or 70 fucking years old going, this is fucking amazing. The unselfishness of these men. The, as we have come to know them, their entire absence of profit motive and their community spirit is indeed inspiring to one who has labored long and fucking wearily in this alcoholic field. This is so fucking important. They believe in themselves and they believe more in the power which pulls these chronic alcoholics back from the gates of death. 
I believe in myself sitting here today in front of you. I believe in myself. I have full self-confidence in who I am, but I believe more in the power that pulled this chronic alcoholic back from the gates of death. My, my self-confidence and my truth and who I am is directly related in my relationship with my God. I believe in myself. And anyone who runs a solid program of recovery, any one of the 50 people, I'm not saying every one of you fucking run a solid program because that'd be a fucking lie. But the, of the people who are running a solid program on this screen, I will guarantee you one thing, that their fucking relationship with their creator is the number one thing of their fucking life. And that that person who experiences a relationship with their creator gives them their self-confidence and authenticity of who they are and what they are, and there's no doubt in who that is. These men believe in themselves and they believe more in the power which pulls these chronic alcoholic back from the gates of death. This is about a relationship with God. This is about a relationship with yourself to a level that you fucking can't even comprehend right now. Through the program of action practically applied following the directions, you will get to know yourself at a level that you will never fucking even comprehend mentally because this is a spiritual fucking journey. Through that, you will find the confidence of who you fucking are. And it will be unfucking shakable. Middle of the next page, quickly. Jesse talked about frothy emotional appeal, seldom suffices. The message which can interest and hold these alcoholic people must have depth and weight. In nearly all cases, nearly all cases, Bill W. gives you that avenue. You may, maybe you can get sober without fucking God. But he does say in nearly all cases, their ideals must be grounded, basis, foundation in a power greater than themselves if they are to recreate their lives. This isn't about getting an old life back. This isn't about fucking receiving what you already had. This is about finding and recreating a new fucking life. Like it talks about in step three, we were reborn. And having the experiential relationship with God and having the vital spiritual experiences that Jesse talked about through the processes of this program, you will fucking have a recreation of your life. And it will not be the same life that you've lived. You will get to live a second life. And if you're anything like me, and you got a chance to live your own life the way that you wanted to do it, and you're absolutely convinced that your life run by you is not successful like I am, when I look at my history and my, me running my life, I fucking hurt people and I hurt myself. When I come to that gut level concession that I can't do it anymore and I let fucking God actually do it, the actual step three decision, not the theoretical idea of fucking God does this, I mean fucking for real, then I have a new experience with God and with myself. And it's not to be intellectualized because the journey of this is not an intellectual journey. Is Chrissy on the screen? Is she gone? Okay. Anyway, next paragraph down. We feel after many years experience that we have found nothing. This is the doctor, his whole life spent helping us. We feel that after many years experience that we have found fucking nothing, zero, which has contributed more to the rehabilitation of these men than what the altruistic movement now growing up among them. The doctor says he's found nothing, man, that has contributed more to the rehabilitation and rebirth of these men than the altruistic movement. Men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. 
The sensation is so elusive that while they can admit that it's injurious, they cannot, after a time, differentiate the truth from the false. To them, their, their alcoholic life seems the only normal one. They're restless, irritable, and discontented, unless they can again experience a sense and ease of comfort, which comes at once by taking a few drinks, drinks which they see others taking with impunity. After they have succumbed to the desire again, as so many do, and the phenomenon of craving develops, they pass through the well-known stages of a spree, emerging remorseful, the firm resolution not to drink again. This is repeated over and over. And unless this person can experience an entire psychic change, there's very little hope of his recovery. On the other hand, it's strange this may seem to those who do not understand. Once a psychic change has occurred, the very same person who seemed doomed had so many problems he despaired of ever solving them, suddenly finds himself easily able to control his desire for alcohol. The only effort necessary being that required to follow a few simple rules. Men have cried out to me in sincere and despairing appeal. Doctor, I cannot go on like this. I have everything to live for. I must stop, but I cannot. You must help me. Face of this problem, if a doctor is honest with himself, he must sometimes feel his own inadequacy. Although he gives all that is in him, it is often not enough. One feels that something more than human power is needed to produce the essential psychic change. Though the aggregate of recoveries resulting from psychiatric effort is considerable, we physicians must admit we have made little impression upon the problem as a whole. Many types do not respond to the ordinary psychological approach. I do not hold with those who believe that alcoholism is, entire a pro is entirely a problem of mental control. I have had many men who had, for example, worked a period of months on some problem or business deal, which is to be settled on a certain date favorably to them. They took a drink a day or so prior to the date, and then the phenomenon of craving at once became paramount to all other interests so that the important appointment was not met. These men were not drinking to escape. They were drinking to overcome a craving beyond their mental control. Okay, so XXV triple I, bottom of the page. It says, while they can admit that it's injurious. So the idea of step one seems to be, if I call myself an alcoholic, then that's step one, right? A lot of people will, you know, like if they're in a meeting and it is a step one meeting, they're going to share about powerless and unmanageability, right? Which that is a very quick synopsis. That's like a boiled down uh, version of what step one actually is. That's a sentence on the wall. And in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, you're given two and a half chapters of information on the topic, right? It says that the alcoholic can admit that it's injurious from an intellectual standpoint, right? I've had many men who, you know, they could tell me what alcohol, you know, has done to them, what it will do to them. And as soon as they leave that same conversation, they're all lit up again. Also too, if an individual comes to our rooms and says that he's a, an alcoholic, but has no fucking idea what the definition of an alcoholic is as per the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, what is he actually admitted, right? From an intellectual standpoint, if somebody calls himself an alcoholic, it means absolutely fuck all. Does anybody know why un, you know, admitting you're an alcoholic from an intellectual standpoint is absolutely useless? I think I'm smarter than, than the alcohol. Why? What makes you think that you're smarter than the alcohol? Because you think you can control using it. Sure. I mean, the book says that the main problem the alcoholic centers in his mind rather than in his body. And that's the mental blank spot, the insane trivial excuse or the plausible excuse. And all that could be boiled down to dishonesty, right? So if I'm dishonest with myself in regards to the drink, I could be dishonest with myself all over my life, in my career, in my finance, in my health, in my reputation, how I'm perceived, my relationships. If I could do that and my thoughts can't be trusted, how can I have a sustainable understanding that I'm fucked in regards to alcohol? And this is why it has to supersede the mind and has to be a gut level concession. There's two bottoms I've had in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous 
that have sustained my, that has sustained my recovery. <coughs> One of which is a bottom of self that's got level concession or concession to the innermost self. The other one is, and that's in regards to the substance. The other one solely in regards to self, right? Understanding that how I operate alcohol being taken out of the question is just as fucked and can do just as much damage as alcohol did in the first place. So while that I can admit that it's injurious, I go to a meeting, I raise my, you know, Johnny raises his hand, he's an alcoholic, right? I don't know what that is, but I want to feel a part of, I, I raise my hand and do the same, right? These are some of the opinions and some of the theories around step one and to have a sustainable step one again is a gut level concession or a concession to the innermost self. Okay, they, they can admit that it's injurious. This is the spiritual malady, and this is what Bill's been alluding to, okay? This is actually the main problem. If this problem is solved, the rest of the cycle cannot fulfill itself. Seven pieces of this cycle. You have the rest of the irritable discontent, the spiritual malady. Then you have the mental obsession. You have the first drink or drug. You have the phenomenon of craving a spree. Those five things can happen in a day. Typically, those things will happen in a couple hours. And I'll, I'll go through that a little bit more uh, thoroughly in the next number of chapters. But the point is, is I could be in a spree in a matter of hours. Now I'm subjected to that spree for a couple of weeks, a couple of months, a couple of years, a decade. If you solve the spiritual malady, this restless, irritable discontent, the rest of the cycle cannot fulfill itself. Welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous and welcome to the main solution found. There's a good reason why step five and 10, like Bill was chatting about, step five, feeling the nearness of your creator and the feeling that the drink problem has disappeared will often come strongly. There's a reason why all of the steps in regards to inventory and the promises of those steps have to do with sustained recovery against the substance. Step 10 promises say that the problem has been removed. We've been placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. All inventory done in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, predominantly five and 10, are the gateway to not only feeling the nearness of your creator, a better understanding of that presence, but when we clear and bore open the channel as a byproduct of that, the rest of irritable discontent spiritual malady is solved. So restless for me is I'm just like I'm crawling out of my skin is the best description I've heard of that. As soon as I'm in the car, as I'm out of the car. When I'm in the car, I'm blasting the heat or it's ice fucking cold. I don't know whether I'm going to piss to the left or piss to the right. I do not feel comfortable in any social situation. Irritable is I'm idling at 75. It doesn't take me much to go all the way to a buck 50. Irritable is don't look at me twice. Don't even look at me. Like I'm, I'm really looking for the out of some sort of a solution of anger. But I will take restless and irritable discontent all day long or restless, restless and irritable all day long compared to discontent. Discontent for me is nothing's right. Nothing will ever be right. And the problem with this spirituality is this spirituality is like a stain on the very existence of my being. I cannot shake it. I cannot get out of it. Discontent, nothing's right. Nothing will ever be right. It's a pit of despair that I can't get out. And ever since I was a young kid, alcohol had the ability to solve that. Now that I come to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and you take the only solution away from me that I've had, to the spiritual malady, it does not get better for me. In fact, it gets worse until I'm able to replace that solution. And so when I replace that solution, much like alcohol, alcohol, alcoholism has two components. It's of the mind and of the body. The solution to the problem also has two components. When it comes to this idea of God, it's a perspective, it's, it's a perspective as far as the intellectual aspect is concerned. And a very good, like the, like the first piece we get in regards to that perspective is God is everything or else is nothing from an intellectual standpoint. 
five on step five past the body component, much like alcohol, there's a solution for God in regards to that. And it's the intuition. Both of them is the solution. One of which in regards to God is the perspective. The other one is the intuition. Okay. So go to X, 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 I, X, top of that page. It says, in the phenomenon of craving develops, we pass through the well-known stages of a spree. I want you to move to page 151. Chapter 11, a vision for you, page 151. For most normal folks, drinking means conventionality, companionship, colorful imagination. It means release from care, boredom, and worry. It is joyous intimacy with friends and a feeling that life is good. But not so with us in those last days of heavy drinking. The old, the old pleasures were gone. They were but memories. Never could we recapture the great moments of the past. There was an insistent yearning to enjoy life as we once did, and a heartbreaking obsession that some new miracle of control would enable us to do it. There was always one more attempt and one more failure. The less people tolerated us, the more we withdrew from society, from life itself. As we became subjects of King Alcohol, shivering dozens of his mad realm, the chilling vapor that his loneliness settled down, it thickened, ever becoming blacker. Some of us sought it out sort of places, hoping to find understanding, companionship, and approval. Momentarily, we did. Then would come oblivion, the awful awakening to face the hideous four horsemen, terror, bewilderment, frustration, despair. Unhappy drinkers will who under who under, who read this page will understand. So, on top of the restless, irritable discontent, the malady is also the four horsemen: terror, bewilderment, frustration, and despair. And now, when I was in a spree, if I had the ability to wake up drunk over, then it was pretty well God's gift. But if I woke up dry, that's how I would wake up every time. Terror, bewilderment, frustration, despair. The first two years of my recovery, every time I woke up, full-blown terror, bewilderment, frustration, despair. Every time I had a nap, if I were to nap after work before I went out and sponsored guys, if I were to have a nap and it was light and I woke up when it was dark, full-blown alcoholic. And so what I like about this piece is this piece, as far as I'm concerned, really illuminates the spree of an alcoholic and what that looks like. Like every time I kicked off a spree, you know, Di Serono on the rocks, I'm buying people drinks. I feel like the life of the party, that seems to be pretty apparent. But by the time that spree's over, I'm drinking black ice, don't have a fucking penny. You know, like I'm gambling, I'm, I'm dropping a thousand dollars a bet. Then, you know, by the time the spree's over, it's 20 bucks, 10 bucks, whatever I can scrounge together. And I am hitting those sordid places, right? And I'm waking up full-blown alcohol. What I like about that piece, like I said, I mean, it, you know, it explains the spree, but this could be somebody's sobriety, very fucking easy. You know, this chilling vapor, like the, the, the chilling vapor that is loneliness settled down, it thickened, ever becoming blacker. Very simply, that could be the spiritual malady. That's definitely this, this discontent as far as I'm concerned. Men have cried out to me in sincere and despairing appeal. He, reiterate, he reiterates this piece where he says, you know, it, before he's talking about this moral psychology, he, he says that he understands the solution, but the application of that presented difficulties. He goes on to say, though the aggregate of recoveries resulting from psychiatric effort is considerable, we physicians must admit we have made little impression upon the problem as a whole. So what's actually really impressive about Dr. Selkworth? Bill had brought up a couple of things about him being a doctor, working in the fear field, uh, working with alcoholics. And that's great. The doctor's opinion is his thesis out of his experience working with real deal drugs. The truth of the matter is, is when it comes to Dr. Silkworth and Roland Hazard, that story, and or um, Carl Young, rather, and Roland Hazard, and Bill Wilson and Dr. Silkworth, the fact that he admitted to his patient, Bill Wilson, that he couldn't help him, the humility of a doctor saying that I can't fucking do it. 
saying that modern medicine isn't to help you. Your solution is something of a spiritual need. That's what's fucking mind blowing. Carl Jung did the, did the same thing to Bill Wilson or Carl Jung to Roland Hazard, right? And that was able to lay these men open to a conversion experience. Okay, the last piece I want to touch on is XXX, top paragraph. I want you to double underline these men were not all the way to bond their mental control. And typically throughout this process, I'll have a man underline, I'll have a man bracket, underline and double underline. If it's a bracket, it's fairly important. At least it warrants a conversation. But if he is sponsoring somebody, he doesn't have the time to go over all the information, then he would negate all brackets. If it's an underline, it's pretty important. If it's a, a double underline, it's very fucking important. Generally, a double underline will be how, how can he take step one and apply it into his life or two? It's practical application. So these men were not drinking to escape. They were drinking to overcome a craving beyond their mental control. Overcome a craving beyond their mental control, which is to say when the body kicks off, the phenomenon of craving, he has the first drink, phenomenon of craving kicks off. It supersedes the mind. It overrides the mind. If anything that I've said in this session today, that if you take home anything, it's that. That is the biggest fucking piece that is missed in the allergy of the body, that the mind is 100% inoperable, that he is drinking to overcome a craving beyond his mental control. It's that piece. It's heavily fucking missed. And if it's properly brought up in a sit when you're sponsoring somebody, it could really fucking illuminate a lot to this gentleman. I've seen men, as this is described, start tearing up. And the purpose really of me taking a man through this book, at least through the number of chapters, is to play the doctor, is to present this information to this man in such a way like Carl Jung had done to Roland Hazard and like Bill and like uh, Dr. Silkworth had done to Bill Wilson. Both those men were laid out to a conversion experience and that's what we're trying to achieve here. That's all I have to say. Okay, good stuff, Jess. <clears throat> I'm just going to reiterate a few things in my own words. Bottom of uh, XXVIII. For the alcoholic, drug addict, meth head, crackhead, fucking heroin junkie, fentanyl addict, whoever the fuck you are, whatever you are, listen the fuck up. Men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol or fucking drugs. That's why we like it, man. That's why I fucking liked it. That's why I put a pipe in my mouth. I like the fucking effect produced by alcohol, by drugs, by whatever the fuck it was. The sensation is so elusive that while they admit it is injurious, the sensation that I once got when alcohol and drugs worked for me, when it worked for my restless, irritable discontentedness, and I picked it up and it fucking soothed me. It gave me ease and comfort. That sensation is now elusive. That's what the fuck we're talking about. You will never fucking get that back. The sensation is so elusive, but that will admit it is injurious, meaning I know that it's bad for me. I'll admit that it's bad for me, but I'm still going to look for the sensation. I'm going to keep on fucking trying because I got a fucking little dial in the back of my brain that says I need relief and I need it now. And I'm going to get it. I'm going to fucking get it. And I'm telling you right now, you will not fucking ever get it again. The sensation that you're looking for is so elusive. It's like trying to catch a chicken. You will not catch the fucking chicken. You might get a couple of his fucking feathers and get that feeling of that elusive feeling that you were looking for, but it's fleeting and it's fucking lost. You guys get me? That's what the fuck we're talking about. 
That feeling is never coming back. But there's a spot in my brain that says, I can't differentiate the true from the false. I think that I'm going to get it again. Many of us pursue this to the gates of insanity or death. This is why it's so important to understand the powerlessness of step one. Jesse talked about when we go to meetings and people share on step one, the unmanageability and the powerlessness. People do not fucking get powerlessness to the fucking depth of what this book is trying to describe. We got the chapter fucking doctor's opinion. We got there's a solution and we got more about alcoholism trying to help you fucking understand the powerlessness of this fucking illness and going to the rooms and listening to some of the bullshit that we hear in the rooms, you will not fucking get what the fuck we're talking about because you need to go. We hope these pages will prove so convincing that no further authentication is necessary. It's not about going to the rooms and trying to figure this shit out. Because half the fucking rooms aren't even alcoholics or addicts. The real deal that this book is fucking made for anyway. So you're listening to a whole bunch of fucking non-alcoholics and non-addicts fucking trying to tell you what your fucking solution is based on three topics of a discussion or their fucking opinions and their ideas. And you wonder why you're fucking continually drunk. But it's working for that guy. Why does it work for that guy? Because he's a fucking heavy drinker. Why does it work for that chick? Because she's there on a social fucking experiment because she can't find fucking friends and this is a good place to fucking do it. This book is made for the real deal hopeless fucking alcoholic addict. And if you are that, you have to understand the depth of what Jesse was trying to talk about and understanding step one. It talks about in step one, we have lost the power of choice in drink. There's no choice here. I have an utter inability to leave it alone, no matter how great the necessity or the wish that I need to. Doesn't matter how many kids I got that are begging for food from me, or the wife, or the job, or fuck all. It doesn't matter. That shit doesn't fucking matter. And although I may be able to quit once in a while on circumstances, Then my brain says, okay, you got this. But then you will prove to yourself that you can't quit on circumstances. And to get sober on circumstantial sobriety, you're as good as drunk anyway, so it doesn't fucking matter. You may make it six months, you may make it a year on circumstantial sobriety, and it's usually not fucking based in the spiritual or altruistic solution. It's based on fucking going to meetings and fucking praying and hoping which is why it doesn't fucking work. The sensation is so elusive that while I admit it is injurious, I know that it's bad for me. I cannot after time differentiate true from the false. I have a brain that tells me a fucking lie over and over and over and over. There's a reason why we need God in this program. To them, their alcoholic life seems the only normal one. We can all relate with that. Living the alcoholic life that seems the only normal one. We can't differentiate the true from the false. And I'll tell you what, same within sobriety. You put the drug and the drink away, the alcoholic life is the only normal one. And you still can't differentiate true from the false. Because you will rationalize and justify the most errant nonsense to suit your actions in your life or your inactions in your life. Because the alcoholic life is the only normal one. This is where we get real right here. Jesse talked about this and he talked what Jesse did say, and it is a fundamental truth. If you can medicate this part, the rest of the cycle will not fulfill itself. This is the most important part of this program right here. And when we talked earlier about the moral psychology, what we're talking about is there's a, there's a system in our brains of ideals, of emotions and attitudes that actually guide our lives. And if we don't fucking like bring these things to the surface, look at them and how they affect us, cast them aside and try something different, there is very little hope of our recovery. That is the moral psychology, which is what this book will produce. 
if you follow the clear cut direction. So they are restless, irritable, and discontented. And that can look like many different forms like Jesse talked about. And for your addict alcoholic who's not really ready, who wants any other excuse, it will look like ADHD. It will look like depression. It will look like uh, anxiety. It'll look like a whole bunch of different shit that you as an alcoholic untreated will go try to treat these other symptoms with the doctor. The problem with you going to treat these symptoms at the doctor is the doctor does not understand alcoholism. The doctors and the medical fraternity do not understand the spiritual malady and the depth of alcoholism. And like Jesse had alluded to, how many times has he worked with somebody and most of these things work themselves out? I don't know how many times I've heard somebody say, I have fucking chronic depression. And then they worked a set of steps and worked a real program and go, I had untreated alcoholism. And there's so many times I've heard so many stories like that. But anyway, we're restless, irritable, discontented. Unless we can again experience a sense of ease and comfort that comes at once by taking the first few drinks. So as I live my life all clouded up in self and life is piling up on me and the kids are fucking at at me, you know, they just want my attention and my wife's at me for my bills and I'm not doing a good enough job at work and I'm not being a good enough friend and I'm not even being a good person to myself and all this shit's piling up on me. And there's a little dial in the back of my mind that goes click, 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 and it goes boom. Unless I can experience a sense of ease and comfort, which comes at once by taking the first few drinks. And we know what that feels like. As soon as you crack that beer, you put that pipe in your mouth, whatever it is, you put that rig on your arm, boom. Everything's okay right fucking now. That's it. But the solution is elusive. And yet it doesn't last. They see others taking with impunity after they have succumbed to the desire again, as so many do. That word succumbed. Does anybody know what succumbed means? It means fail to resist. So when you and when me and Jesse talk about us being big book thumpers, literature Nazis, every fucking word matters. Because every word explains the next word. Every sentence flows into the next sentence and every sentence flows into every paragraph. Every paragraph flows into every page and every page back flows into every other page and every step flows back into each step. As we succumb to the desire again, which means you fail to resist because you don't have fucking power, which is why we need God's power. As we succumb to the desire again, as so many do, we put the substance in our bloodstream because we don't have a choice. The phenomenon of craving develops. Like Jesse said, now we are not drinking to escape life anymore. I'm drinking to overcome a physical craving beyond my mental control. You could cut my head off. And my body's going to keep on putting the substances in my body because my mind is no longer in control. Even though I think it is, and sometimes it seems like it is, it's not. The book tells me, at a certain point, the alcoholic has no effect of mental defense against the first drink or drug. So what is that saying? At a certain point, I do have power? Yeah. Yeah. At a certain point, I do have some power. I can play the tape forward. And you hear that in the rooms all the time. Play the tape forward. I play the tape forward. What about when you can't play the tape forward? Do you know when that is? 
Do you, when the, do you know when that moment is where you don't have a mental defense, even though sometimes you can remember what's going to happen to your kids and your family, the pain, the misery, and the suffering of a day, a week, a month ago? You can remember that sometimes, right? I know I could. But what about the time where I had no effective mental defense and I found, found myself with the pipe in my mouth because I succumbed to the desire because I had no fucking choice because I lived in the spiritual malady so badly. What about then? The thing with us is once we set off the phenomenon of craving, you're not, you can tell yourself I'm back into treatment next week. Good fucking luck. Because it don't work like that. You know how many people I fucking have known that have said they're done and they were never done. I've known one person in all my years that had time in, that slipped, that got sober right away. One. Almost nobody ever gets sober again after having time in right away. And the thing is, is you could die. And many of them do die. So the phenomenon of craving develops. They pass through the well-known stages of spree, emerging remorseful with the firm resolution not to drink again. This is repeated over and over and over. Unless this person can experience the entire psychic change, there is very little hope of his recovery. And when we talk about the moral psychology rearrangement, the psychic change, we're talking about the ideals, the emotions, and the attitudes that are deeply ingrained in my head that I need to expose and fucking try something different. And you will never be able to do that just up to step three, because step three will never fucking produce the essential psychic change, because you will never see the problem of why you need to pick up a drink until at minimum you start step four and step five. And once you start clearing out that channel, like Jesse said, you will start to feel the nearness of your creator after a good step five, which is so important to get through these steps in a manner that's rather speedious. And then before I move on here, I want to highlight one more thing. We're talking about the substance being the solution for the restless irritable discontentedness. I'm just going to touch on this quickly, but we will be coming back to this over and over and over through the study. As I am restless, irritable, discontented, and I have no solution of a substance to put in my body anymore, because I know, and I'm pretty good with step one, I will succumb to the desire for anger. I will succumb to the desire for lust. I will succumb to the desire for relationships. I will succumb to the desire for fucking judgment. I will succumb to the desire for greed. I will succumb to the desire for whatever it is that gives me the sense of power over you. And as I succumb to that desire, I go on the spree. I can go on an anger spree. What happens? Anyone here struggle with anger? When I go oh. on the spree of anger, I fucking take the anger I fucking use it for my ease and comfort because I'm living in a spiritual malady. And then I go on the spree and I fucking get power when I give you both barrels of my anger. And then I emerge remorseful. I feel like shit. I swear off. I wish I didn't do it. And this is repeated over and over and over. Same thing with porn. Your restless, irritable discontent until you get the a sense of ease and comfort that comes out once by watching some porn. So you go on the spree of porn, which you succumb to. You don't really want to, but you fucking do it anyway. Same with anger. And then you go on the spree. And then you come out of watching the porn and you feel shittier about yourself. And you, re you emerge remorseful. And inside your being, you swear off and go, I'm not doing that anymore. And this is repeated over and over and over unless you can again experience the entire psychic change in this area. Same with relationships, ladies and gentlemen. How many times have you pursued the relationship because there's fucking power there and it's a power battle 
and then you get what you want, but it never did. It never does what you wanted it to do because it's fucking elusive. The sensation is so elusive. Doesn't give you what you fucking really want. And you go on the spree of the relationship and you usually fucking ruin friendship and you ruin a friendship with yourself and then you emerge remorseful and you swear off, but then you're in another relationship. This goes on and on and on. And if you keep living in all of these different things, and there's many, many more, if you keep living in these different areas, you will fucking drink again. Why? Because you're living in selfish self-centeredness and you're living in the restless, irritable, discontented, what took you to drink anyway. Unless you can experience an entire psychic change, the moral rearrangement in these aspects of your life, you will drink again which is why the substance is never the issue. And as we get more down the road in this, you'll see what the fuck we're actually talking about. Okay, Jess, that's all I got. Okay, there are many situations which arise out of the phenomenon of craving, which cause men to make the supreme sacrifice rather than continue to fight. Classification of alcoholics seems most difficult and in much detail is outside the scope of this book. There are, of course, the psychopaths who are emotionally unstable. We're all familiar with this type. They're always going on the wagon for keeps. They are over remorseful, make many resolutions, but never a decision. There's the type of man who is unwilling to admit that he cannot take a drink, plans various ways of drinking. He changes his brand or his environment. There's the type who always believes that after being entirely free from alcohol for a period of time, he could take a drink without danger. There's the manic depressive type who is perhaps the least understood by his friends and about whom a whole chapter could be written. Then there are many types entirely normal in every respect, except in the effect alcohol has upon them. They're often able, intelligent, friendly people. All these and many others have one symptom in common. They cannot start drinking without developing the phenomenon of craving. This phenomenon, as we have suggested, may be the manifestation of an allergy which differentiates these people, sets them apart as a distinct entity, has never been by any treatment with which we are familiar, permanently eradicated. The only relief we have to suggest is entire abstinence. This immediately precipitates us into a seething cauldron of debate. Much has been written pro and, pro and con. But among physicians, the general opinion seems to be that most chronic alcoholics are doomed. What is the solution? Perhaps I could best answer this by relating one of my experiences. About one year prior to this experience, a man was brought in to be treated for chronic alcoholism. He had been partially recovered from a gastric hemorrhage and seemed to be a case of pathological mental deterioration. He had lost everything worthwhile in life and was only living, one might say, to drink. He frankly admitted and believed that for him there was no hope. Following the elimination of alcohol, there is found to be no permanent brain injury. He accepted the plan outlined in this book. One year later, he called to see me and I experienced a very strange sensation. I knew the man by name and partly recognized his features, but there all resemblance ended from a trembling, despairing, nervous wreck had emerged a man brimming over with reliance and contentment. I talked with him for some time, but was not able to bring myself to feel that I had known him before. To me, he was a stranger and so he left me. A long time has passed, no return to alcohol. When I need a mental uplift, I often think of another case brought in by a physician prominent in New York. The patient had made his own diagnosis, deciding his situation hopeless, had hidden in a deserted bar determined to die. He was rescued by a search party and a desperate condition brought to me. Following his phys physical rehabilitation, he had talked with me in which he frankly stated he thought the treatment a waste effort. Unless I could assure him, which no one ever had, that in the future we'd have the willpower to resist the impulse to drink. His alcoholic problem was so complex, his depression so great, that we felt his only hope would be through what we then called moral psychology, and we doubted if that would have any effect. However, he did become sold on the ideas contained in this book. He's not had a drink for a great many years. I see him now and then, and he's a fine spe specimen of manhood as one could wish to meet. I earnestly advise every alcoholic to read this book through, and though perhaps he came to scoff, he may remain to pray, William D. Silkworth, MD. So, back top of the page, XXX. 
says there are many situations which arise out of the phenomenon of craving, which cause men to make the supreme sacrifice rather than continue to fight. Move to page 136. Chapter 10 to the employers, 136, second paragraph down. I was at one time assistant manager of a corporation department employing 6,600 men. One day my secretary came in saying that Mr. B insisted on speaking with me. I told her to say that I was not interested. I had warned him several times that he had but one more chance. Not long afterward, he had called me on Hartford on two successive days so drunk he could hardly speak. I told him he was through finally and forever. My secretary to return to say that it was not Mr. B on the phone. It was Mr. B's brother, and he wished to give me a message. I still expected a plea for clemency, but these words came through the receiver. I just wanted to let you know Paul jumped from a hotel window in Hartford last Saturday. He left us a note saying you're the best boss he ever had, and that you're not to blame in any way. Another time, as I opened a letter which lay on my desk, a newspaper clipping fell out. It was the obituary of one of the best salesmen I ever had. After two weeks of drinking, he placed his toe on the trigger of a loaded shotgun. The barrel was in his mouth. I discharged him for drinking six weeks before. Still another experience, a woman's voice came faintly over long distance from Virginia. She wanted to know if her husband's company insurance was still in force. Four days he had hung himself in his woodshed. The only thing I'm going to say on that, I think the book says it better than I could, but it's very rare that I've worked with a guy and he's thought about suicide or was going, you know, made the decision to kill himself drunk. It's almost always makes a decision sober and has to get liquored up in order to, to kill himself. And really what, what we're outlining here, although we've chatted about the allergy of the body, there's three main things that we've chatted about that has nothing to do with alcohol. First of which is the rest is irritable discontent. Second of which is the hideous four horsemen, both combined is called alcoholism and suicide, right? And eventually the alcoholic has so much self, the so much them on them, so much me on me, that the only way out is a drink or blowing my fucking brains out. And that's what we're talking about. There are many situations which arise out of the phenomenon of craving, which cause men to make the supreme sacrifice rather than continue to fight. Next piece I, next piece I want to talk about, they're over remorseful, make many resolutions, but never a firm decision. And so quite often when a guy's in a spree, he could have like, he could be shaken awake Let's say he loses his job, he smacks up a car. He could be shaken out of, or, or he runs out of money. That's like the most common way. It's not that the body's done with them. It's circumstances that have enabled him to stop. Quite often, a man in that position will, you know, ask me to work with him or whatever. And I'll tell him, listen, go to fucking, you know, detox, call me when you're out type of stuff. And this guy is over remorseful. He'll make many resolutions to me. He'll probably be crying to me on the phone. Jess, I'm done. I'm over it. This, this, that, yada, yada. And then I don't hear from him for a couple of months. He's, his body's not done with him. He's not making a firm decision. How do you know that it's done? Pass through the well-known stages of a spree, emerging remorseful, the firm resolution not to drink again. So quite commonly, if a guy goes to detox, it's a good sign of a firm resolution. If a guy's in one of the treatment centers, there's a good chance it's a firm resolution. Those are the guys you want to be working with. The other guys will 100% waste your time. Other than that, I think I'm good, Bill. No, I think I'm good, bro. Hey, one piece. One piece I do want to share just quickly is that the only solution to the alcoholic problem that Dr. Silkworth gives you is two stories of members of Alcoholics Anonymous. As he already reiterated, he said it once, said it again, that he has no fucking solution on this thing. The only solution is these, this altruistic movement now growing up among these, these um, hopeless alcoholics, right? 
And of course, as you guys know, at least in my case, you know, the only, I tried just about everything I could before I got to these doors. The only thing that worked for me was the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and the solution found in this book. Okay, I would like to touch base on one on one thing. Um, I can't remember where it was, but it's definitely in the doctor's opinion. It says the only suggestion, the only relief we have to suggest is entire abstinence, which is great. That's the only suggest. That's the only relief that the doctor has to suggest is entire abstinence. But uh, when you understand the powerlessness of this. Abstinence is not really an option. And there's only one way to achieve abstinence. It's through working on the plan of recovery on the spiritual malady. Once you learn what it means to actually turn your will and your life over to the care of God, and I don't mean on a theoretical basis, because there's a lot of theoretical basis turning your will and your life over to the care of God in the programs, whether they be Cocaine Anonymous, Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, doesn't matter which one it is. It's a theoretical mental thing only. And when you understand how to actually do that through the practical application, life changes, man. And some of the promises in this book is Bill W., when he had a spiritual awakening, his drink problem was removed was taken away that very night years ago. He's been placed in a position of neutrality. He doesn't want to drink, doesn't, doesn't ever think about drinking. Why? Because he's recreated his life through the decision of step three that actually is applied after step three, which is very important. So that's all I got for tonight, my friend Jesse and my other friends. Okay, that's great. Uh, so <coughs> Bill has <clears throat> Bill has his email on uh, on the thing. I got my email as well there, as well as my phone number. If you have any questions on what I said or what Bill said, you could just email us. Um, and then when it comes to the next session, it's going to be a little bit different. We're actually going to be together. And hopefully Bill will get over what uh, this fucking Delta variant, whatever he's been dealing with, we'll be able to get a little bit more prep time in there as well. This session went a little bit over. It's quite common that these sessions will go 15 to 30 minutes over, but we'll try our best to keep it to the nine o'clock mark, okay? So maybe what we'll do is we'll shut it down with the serenity prayer and then fucking move on with our lives. And feel free to pass this on as far as you can pass it. Okay. God. God. Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Courage to change the things I can. And the wisdom to know the difference. Okay, guys. Thank you for coming, and we'll see you next week.